Hi folks, welcome to Crisco's Corner. Unfiltered commentary. And that's your truth, the real truth. Please like, share, and subscribe. And as always, thank you for your support. Welcome back. A little change of pace here on Crisco's Corner. An interview with Sari Chrisman, the author of The Tales of Jet Samoka. It's a fictional series that takes place in the late 1800s in the Pacific Northwest. This is part two of three of talking with Sarah. Uh, she's a great author. I'm going to leave the link to her Amazon page for her books and also a link to her YouTube page. And I hope that everyone reads her books. She's a great author. Anybody that's interested in the Victorian era, please get a hold of Sarah's books and it's a great reading. So here we are. This is part two of three. I hope you enjoy it. Yeah, that, that ties in like the character development and uh, some of the, you must do a ton of research. Oh yeah, absolutely. I, mean, I like I said, I do, I, I read 19th century books and magazines all the time. That's right. what I do. I'm constantly reading books and magazines and diaries and newspapers from the 19th century. Right. And I'm constantly taking notes on all of these. The The thing about reading materials from the time I'm writing about is that when you read secondary sources, when you read things oh, okay. written about a different time, right. it's a bit like a game of telephone. Yep, yep. So, you should live one, in school where you line up 10 kids and you whisper in the first ear and then see what comes out on the other end. Yep. Right, exactly. So by the time it comes out on the other end, it's very garbled. And a lot of history gets written that way, because one generation will write down something often very scathing about their parents. Right. And then someone else reads that and they put their own spin on it. Well, and then it just yeah. gets progressively farther and farther from the way things started I mean, out. Yeah, I mean, social social life is different for each generation. And as, the, yeah. as technology changes, the social structure changes as well. Yeah. And if you go back to the materials that were actually written in the time you're writing about, then you get a fresh perspective on it well, and you get yeah. to find out. Well, you're funny you say that because I know I'm a big Civil War fan and there's a ton of books written on the Civil War. But the number one book they say is the most accurate and the best one is uh, U.S. Grant's memoirs because he wrote them firsthand. Mm -hmm. and absolutely he, yeah, he saw and he did and it wasn't secondhand stuff he he was actually there and they say that's one of the most amazing memoirs ever written yeah memoirs and diaries right. i especially love they're amazing resources and there are a surprising number of published diaries out there of journals people kept in the 19th century and they're wonderful resources and as i'm reading all of these things i I'm perpetually taking notes on them. Okay. I'm perpetually right. looking for things that can be plot ideas. I'm perpetually looking for things that can contribute to characters and also little turns of phrases that I can crib, like Nurse McCoy's dialogue. Right. And a lot of painters, I, I mean, I, I don't paint myself. I would, I would be terrible at it, uh, but I have heard about a lot of painters who start by mocking up the the anatomy of their figures before they even get to the outside details and the outside right, features. Right, right. And it's the same for an author. You really have to write your characters from the bones out. You have to get to the point where you're thinking of them as actual people before you can make them live for your oh, readers. Of course, absolutely. Yeah, in other words, uh, you'll probably see a turn of phrase or you'll read a story and says, oh, that's what Felix would say or that's what Kitty would say or, you know what I mean? He would Because yeah. to you, they're real people. Absolutely, absolutely. Which, uh, and there's ahead. a little bit of myself in all of them. <laughs> well, of course. Okay. I tried writing years ago when I was younger. Uh, I'm great at storytelling, you know, verbally. But writing, eh, not so much. <laughs> I, I used to be a city councilman uh, from 2000, 2007 here in upstate New York, and all the meetings were televised, and everybody used to say, boy, you speak the best out of any of them, but I try to write that down, forget it. <laughs> I'm great at speaking and off the cuff, but when it comes to putting words down on paper, I just can't do it. It's just the way it is. But uh, what is it? it's going to tie in here. I, I see as, as your books, and I got them all lined up here in front of me, 
Well, I was going to finish Three Women a Wheel, which is number six in the series, The Tales of Chetsamoka, but I didn't get a chance last night. But I noticed, you know, time is progressing uh, from mm -hmm. the first book. And so obviously it's in real time, so to speak, uh, without giving away anything. As time goes on, this is a really, it's a, it's, technology is changing dramatically in the late mm -hmm. 19th, early 20th century. And so are you going to uh, chug along as far as time goes and technologies change? Is that kind of what you have in mind for the future of the series? Well, the plan is to bring the series up to the turn of the 20th century. Oh, don't and, stop. And... Don't stop there. Keep going. <laughs> well, it was deliberately chosen and deliberately planned out because the core of what connects all these friends right. is that they're all members of the same cycling club right. or they're related to the cycling club in some way. Yeah. And the 1880s and 90s were sort of the golden age for bicycles. And after right. the turn of the 20th century, the automobile came in. Well, and then that changed a lot of things. Oh, of course. Yeah. So by focusing on that period of time, I can focus on the thing that joins all these characters oh, together. You're breaking my heart. You're breaking my heart. Aww. <laughs> I thought it would be really interesting to see the, these characters we'll call old school and the uh -huh. new school technology comes in and how they perceive it and interact with it and how they adjust. I thought they would be fascinating. Well, the one big change you're going to get to see when you read Sparks Press is that right around 1890 is when the pneumatic safety bike came in. Okay. So that's when people went from the old high wheel ordinary bicycles to the pneumatic safety that look like our modern bicycles. Right. And Felix, and the, one of the advantages of the pneumatic safety that made it really popular was that it was a lot faster oh, okay. than the old ordinaries. And Felix, as the racer, is going to be the first one to get one of those. Of course. Yeah. And, and then, uh, oh, boy, I hope you continue on. Uh, so, yeah. Only do six months at a time then if you're going to stop at 1900. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, uh, which which brings us to, as you said, Sparks Press, which is your latest uh, book in the series. I can tell from the little synopsis you had in the picture on the front that not much has changed as far as media goes, has it? <laughs> it's very true. It's very true. Very, There's very uh, timely, I might add. Yes. Yes, uh, absolutely. Today, There's a lot of hyperbole today, that yeah. goes on in media then and right, now. Right. And Felix gets, after... He's been a journalist for a number of years. He gets really jaded yeah. by it because his life's goal has been to ennoble journalism and tell the truth and get all the false news out and get all the real news in. Right. And his, his editor just isn't letting him because his think, editor just wants what will sell. Right, I'm, really, I'm really into politics and because my channel is mostly politics, except for when I interview nice people like you. But the thing of it is, though, people think that somehow back 100 years, 120 years, 130 years in this case, that somehow people are less intelligent. They're not as mean spirited as they are now, and they don't do wonderful things. If people are people are people for the last 10,000 years, nothing has changed. Yeah, absolutely. I've got a quote right here that was written in 1888. And this quote will blow your mind because it'll just show you how little we've changed. Oh, so, yeah. yeah, of course. Go ahead. Quote, we think that the age in which we live is the age, that the people among whom we move are the favorite of the earth, that our ways are the best, that our methods are the nearest allied to those of omniscience that the crisis we face is the most momentous. Uh -huh. As a matter of fact, crises are as regular in the history of nations as the rising of the sun and the going down thereof, unquote. That was in I, Cosmopolitan Magazine in 1888. Yeah, I was trying to talk to some people that come to my store. It's kind of in a low-income area, and they're talking about the current pandemic. And I went, you guys have no clue what a real pandemic is. <laughs> and my grandmother and my and my aunt, she was 103. She just died last summer. They used mm -hmm. to tell me stories. If you punch in the population percentages, mm -hmm. you're looking at millions of people would be in today and, and the misery. And, and, but the thing hasn't changed. I argued with a person the other day about the U.S. Constitution, and she was a younger person. She says, well, that's kind of archaic, horse and buggy legislation. It doesn't fit today. So listen, here's the deal. People are people are people, and they will always manage to do the wrong thing or the right thing given the proper circumstance. No, nope, it hasn't changed a bit. Right, absolutely. Humans are humans. Yeah, with all their all their faults and all their 
Uh, they, they're capable of such wonderful things, and at the same time, they're capable of such incredibly evil things. So it's always been the same. Yeah, absolutely. And the important thing is to focus on the good in humanity and keep working for that. Yeah. Another quote I love where one of the writers from the 1880s said, a banished trouble soon starves. Yeah. Refuse to dwell in shadows when there is so much sunshine in the world. Well, I like, I like the quote. In fact, I have it here. I wrote it down. And I keep it by my, uh, by my computer. And it says, technology is a good servant, but a bad master. <laughs> Absolutely. That's, uh, everybody thinks, you know, that, that people are so much more intelligent now and we're so much more sophisticated. And it's absolute nonsense. In fact, in a lot of ways, I think they might have been more intelligent and more sophisticated. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, the thing is, they were accustomed to thinking for themselves and problem solving for themselves. Yeah, they were very so. creative uh, on how to make things work. Uh, like I know my father and... Uh, he just passed away about three years ago, but he was in his early 80s, and he was like the first generation from his family born. He had six sisters and a brother in the United States because my grandparents were they call off the boat Italians. And he was telling me stories even when in the 40s and 50s. You had to make things work. I mean, you uh, mm -hmm. this broke. You found a way to fix it. You didn't just throw something away, and, and things were made to last, and you took care of things because they were expensive, and plus the fact even if they weren't. It's a sin yeah. to throw something out if you can help it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And there was also the idea that self-sufficiency is part of being a functional adult. Yeah. And that I got it. it I, I talked to a girl the other day because uh, I'm upstate New York and there's some mass requirements around because of the pandemic and not. And I, I have a big table between, I have bottle redemption center. And I don't know if you have that in Washington state, but I take bottles and, you know, and there's a white table, and I'll say, well, if you don't have a mask on, you got to stand away. If you don't have one on, I say, listen, my health is my responsibility, and your mm -hmm. health and safety is your responsibility. They looked at me like I had three heads, like they never, <laughs> you know, like what, you, like, what is that so surprising? I just don't understand. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting because they, in historic times, people had much more of an understanding that hardships and crises are challenges to overcome. They're not things that you wallow in. <laughs> yeah, like in other words, you're trying to make it so there's no misery in the world. And if you take, there'll be no joy either. It just comes with, it's, all, it's a package deal and you just have to accept it and do the best you can. And keep calm and carry on. Yeah, that's uh, English. Yeah, I did. I was in England once years ago, back in the early 80s. I got to meet the Queen Mother, believe it or not. Oh, wonderful. I remember wonderful. we were by the Tower of London, by the Thames River, and this huge, beautiful yacht pulls up. I guess it was having some kind of mechanical problem. And I was right in the front by the river, and she come off. Now, that's the current Queen's Mother. And mm -hmm. I was right in the front, so she was shaking hands, and I shook her hand, and I said, well, it was very nice to meet you, ma'am. She goes, oh, an American. How nice. Because, <laughs> of course, I don't, I don't hear the accent, but she does. You know, she can hear the American accent, so to speak. So it was, it was pretty cool. Yeah. But I, uh, this ties in good um, with the culture of the time and education, intelligence. I know I read a lot, and you, you mentioned the Bicycle Club. And mm -hmm. clubs were huge back then. I mean, everything you could possibly think of had a club. Even here in Binghamton, where I live, there was about 75,000 back then. It was about 45,000 in the city now. But there was a club for everything, both, both men and women. It was really yeah. amazing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And bicycle clubs were some of the first clubs to allow women in them. Right, right. There was a tradition going back hundreds of years before sports clubs came in in the 19th century, there was a tradition going back hundreds of years where the club was a place for men to go and socialize because the women basically had rule of the entire house and right, right. The, the men weren't always as comfortable there because they knew that their wives were sort of going, are you going to make that mess? Yeah. Really? Honestly? Yeah. Yeah, everybody <laughs> thinks that the, all these, uh, well, they call it the patriarchy, that all these guys order their wives around and all that's absolute nonsense. It was just the opposite, actually. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Like, like, Word like, impact is in our language for a like, reason. Like you, that stuff on your shoes. Why didn't you wipe your feet? What's the matter with you? I mean, you know, it's not like people think at all. 
right? So the club was a place where men could get away from that. Right. But then in the late 19th century, some clubs started allowing in women. And the cycling clubs were one of the first ones to do it, which was revolutionary at the time because there was this masculine space that was supposed to be the men's retreat that's supposed to be the one place where they didn't have to worry about uh peeving the women but then the women are coming in they say okay i I suppose this is all right and they especially they especially got used to the idea when they when the younger men started realizing that well there's women there so and so's sister is not bad looking yeah no no where am i gonna be able to do the things i like to do and me Pretty girls at the same time, of course. Absolutely. Exactly. I know exactly. I, uh, I got a lot of it from, I don't know if you ever saw it or not, the Ken Burns that did the Civil War series did uh, the history of baseball in the United States. And the starts in like the late 1700s, early 1800s, and how the social clubs and the baseball clubs, they had a league, we'll say, in Pennsylvania, in Steel, Steelworks. And they had mm-hmm. a league. And 20,000 people would show up just for a league of steel workers playing baseball. It was an amazing thing. It was absolutely Yeah, astounding. absolutely. And, uh, absolutely. I, I know that here in Port Townsend, there was a, a football club. And the one of the men who lived in my house in the 1890s was a member of the football club. Okay. And the biggest game they ever played was an occasion where they let women in for free to watch. Oh. And the idea is that if you let the women in for free... Yeah. Their boyfriends and husbands and sons and fathers are going to come along, and they're going to be the ones paying. So oh, you're going to get yeah. lots and lots of people you know, so watching. To, today, they would call that marketing. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, Absolutely. In, in education as well is, is a fallacy that everybody was illiterate and dumb, and women women went to college. Women had educations. In fact, most of, often, the yeah. wives were way more education than the husbands, and, and the male-female dynamic is much different than today portrays it. It's, it's um, Yeah, absolutely. In Three Women a Wheel, book six in my series, we've got a university graduate who's Ethel, um, I, and I, yep. she attended the, the, the territorial university here in Washington, which is now the university of Washington, which was my alma mater. Oh, okay. And at one point, oh, and incidentally, the first, first graduate from the university of Washington was a woman. And at one point, Ethel in the story tells the other characters a story about a little romance that she watched between one of her professors, who's a lady professor, Miss uh-huh. Hansi, uh-huh. and one of the fellow students, Edmund Meany. And that's a true story. When I was going to the University of Washington as a student in the late 20th century, so I, I went there from 99 to 2002 okay. was when I graduated. Right. And when I was going there, I lived in a dormitory named the Hansi Dormitory, and it was named after this professor. Oh, okay in the early history of the University of Washington. And Miss Hansi actually did have a little romance with one of her students, who is Edmund Meany. Oh, who, that must have been a big scandal. It was a bit of a scandal. And it was sort of a, it wound up being sort of a sad story because she wound up moving away for health reasons. And he, basically he found someone else. So it was this tragic romance. But their letters are still in the archive at the University of oh, Washington. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. And so that whole story that Ethel tells the other women is the true story of this romance between Edmund and Maddie, Edmund Meany and Maddie Hansey right. that I got to learn by reading their letters to each other that are still in the archive at the UW. Mm-hmm. 